Today on the First Time Storytelling Broadcast, my guest is Ken Curry. Kim was a radio broadcaster for 33 years, but was forced into retirement due to having multiple sclerosis. He is married to an amazingly supporting wife, and they both live in Lo Loveland, Colorado. Kim is here to share the story of how a great career was stopped by a chronic disease. Welcome to the show, Kim. Good morning, Ann. It was nice talking to you before we got started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I think we could have forgotten about the show and just kept on chatting. So, it happens. Uh, it happens. <laughs> but it's good. It's good to get that flow going before going live. So, can please share with us? Because we have some people listening who have heard the term MS but don't quite understand what it is. If you could tell us what it is and how you came about first discovering okay. that you had it. Uh, and uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, there's a couple of things that happen. Lesions appear on different parts of the brain. And as you know, different parts of the brain affect different parts of your body. So if a lesion appears over here and it affects your legs, then that's what happens. If a lesion appears over here on your shoulder, uh, where your shoulders are, are that, then that's what falls apart. In my particular case, I have lesions on my brain and in my spine. I have them in both places. So it just so happens that one of the lesions that I have in my brain, and there are multiple, but one of them that I have is right around the adrenaline part of my body. When, when I start to get anxious or like what we're doing now, we're live, um, I can tell you that underneath my desk, my legs are sticking straight out because my adrenaline is running. And that's how my body reacts to the lesions in my brain. Um, so what happened was, it was a very strange life. I had a few exacerbations that I didn't know what happened. I had a couple things that I couldn't explain. I thought I got stung by some bees one time. I thought I had just maybe stumbled and hit my head one time. Um, but I was a 33-year radio broadcaster. In 25 years of those 33 years, I was in Miami, Florida. And the last nine years of those 25 years, I was the program director of a radio station called Power 96. Still going, was going before I got there. But when I was in charge for the nine years, we had a great staff. It was the most successful radio station in the Southeast USA at the time. Going very, very well for me personally. I was a single dad for four years, uh, running my really great radio station. I got married to a wonderful woman. We were together for five years. And then in 2004, when the tsunami hit, um, the big tsunami in 2004, we happened to be home visiting my mother here in Colorado, came in from Miami to visit my mom. And she had never even heard the word tsunami. So we spent a lot of time for that week watching what was happening and me explaining to her what, was, what had occurred and why it was so dangerous. At the end of the the visit, she said to me, there's something wrong with you. Your face doesn't look right. You're not walking straight. So there's something wrong with you. And I, I thought, mom, you know, I've been real busy and this tsunami's really got me concerned. It's probably just that. So I went back home uh, to Miami somewhere around January or February. I would get up early in the morning before I went to the office to run the radio station. I get up early and I'd go out and play nine holes of golf. I lived on Don Shula's golf course very famous football coach, Don Shula's course. And, and so I get out early in the morning and I'd play at 6.30 and I get nine holes in. And then one day I took a swing and as I finished the swing, I felt this thing happen in my lower back, which is one of the places where the lesions have, have appeared. Um, at that point is when my life changed. I ended up in the doctor's office after that um, and went through about two, maybe two and a half months of testing Multiple sclerosis is such that it takes a lot. What they try to do is they think they go after what it isn't first. Uh, whatever your symptoms are, they can be different in every person because of where the lesions fall, whether in the brain or in the spine. So it takes them a long time to decipher. They put you through skin tests, uh, blood flow tests, uh, uh, needle tests, uh, eye tests. Um, do they know what creates the lesions? Man, they don't. They don't. Um, it is a, it's a mis mystery. They have no clue. Uh, another thing happens is there's a lining that goes around the, the, the nerve system. It's called the myelin. And the myelin nerve system, for some reason, in MS patients, 
the sheet on the outside of the nerves begins to fall away. It begins to deteriorate. So those two things, the myelin deterioration and the lesions are what multiple sclerosis is, and they don't have a clue why. Now, go ahead. You so as you're, as you're going through these tests, yes. are you doing your own research on the side? <laughs> Can I tell you, Anne, I, I didn't really know what it was. I had no clue. I just wanted an answer. And as these tests are going on for a couple of months now, needless to say, I'm starting to get distracted from the radio station because my personal, I'm, I, at that, by now, I'm really not walking straight. By then, my eye was almost dark, my right eye. My shoulder had a deep, intense pain. And these are all some of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, but I had no clue. So the doctor performs all the tests. The thing that really solidifies the diagnosis is the spinal tap. And unfortunately, I, um, for some reason, the, the spinal fluid in my spine had dried up and they didn't know why, but, and they didn't know until the following happened. My MS doctor at the time, Dr. Calagua, took me in for a regular spinal tap. They do them all the time. She performed it. And when she entered, which hurts, she stopped for a moment and said, I'm getting nothing. <laughs> and she pulled the needle out. She says, well, that's not supposed to happen. Let me go get somebody else. Now let some other, some, one other doctor try. Brought in another tech. Bend me over again. Uh, insert the needle into my spine. Same thing. He's like, I'm not getting anything. What's going on? So now I've done two of these. And there's about an hour in between because the pain is intense. So then they, then they decided to go get the spinal tap specialist, the guy who knows how to do this. So they bring in this other guy and he has me positioned on the table in a different way. Well, when he pushes the needle in, he hits a nerve and all of my extremities go sticking out straight and I almost fall off the table while the needle is still in my spine. And he stops and goes, whoa, what's going on here? So what they ended up doing was putting me under an x-ray machine to locate the spinal fluid and then go there. Um, they figured that the part of my MS was that my spinal fluid was, was drying up for some reason. Uh, and they take that information, uh, the tests and the spinal fluid, and then they come up with a diagnosis. And, and um, So how are you commu communicating all of this with your family and with yourself? Like how... Well, you know, I didn't want to scare anybody. I'm a pretty tough guy. And, you know, when I, had, you know, being the, the guy at Power 96 in Miami is a pretty big deal. So I kind of have a reputation. So I didn't let anybody know what was going on. I, I even kept a lot of it for my wife. My wife knew I was doing the testing, but I didn't tell her what the doctors were saying when I was in the testing. Um, but then when the diagnosis came down, you know, uh, I was at a corporate meeting. Uh, and at the corporate meeting, I was called out of the office and I went to the phone and my doctor said, we've come up with the decision. It's multiple sclerosis. And here's what you need to talk about now with your wife. And they just, she just told me that, um, it things were going to change over the phone. Well, she, she, this is my love. I love my doctor. She, I mean, Dr. Calagua was my lifeline and, you know, I, I'm once again, um, pretty personable dude. <laughs> and I get along very well with all my healthcare people. I always have. And Dr. Clog was my friend and I, she knew I was going to be in corporate. And I told her to call me when she got the information. So, you know, and then, so I went home and, and actually on the way home from corporate, our corporate office was over in Naples, Florida on the West coast of Florida and Miami, of course, on the East coast, on the drive home, my wife and I were on the cell phone the entire time. And she was there Googling things and telling me what she was learning. And by the time I got to the house, we were pretty drained and knew that we were in trouble, that something was, was certainly going on that we needed to figure out. Um, but, but the only thing I could figure to do over that whole weekend, I knew that I was distracted and I love my radio station and I wanted to get away. So I walked in on Monday morning and told my boss that uh, I got the MS diagnosis and I need to get out of here. So I'm going home. And they tried to keep me on. They tried to get me another position in the company, but I was, to me, I, I was going down really hard and I wanted to get home. I mean, really home. I mean, I left Miami in about a four or five month period. I packed up everything, got my everything together and, and came home to my mom in Canyon City, Colorado. Cause all I could think was I wanted to go home. 
You know, I, I was, hmm. I knew I had a chronic disease and I was sick and my wife was concerned. And, you know, I had kids uh, around the country because I got a bunch of kids and, uh, you know, I, I, we just wanted to come home. And, um, you know, I knew I'd have my friends, my family. I mean, you know, I grew up in this town and my high school friends were there. It's a very small town, only one high school. But I knew if I needed help, I'd have a support system. So I just went home. First thing I could do, you know. Wow. So that's that's interesting. I, I mean, because I can't imagine how I would handle a diagnosis like that. I think it would impact everybody differently so yeah. for you it's interesting because it, it called you home it was it, it, yeah I just wanted to go I wanted to go take it easy I wanted to go take it easy and and you know and and like I said I'm a I, I'm a pretty tough guy I, I didn't want to believe it in fact I still don't believe it if you know me you know that I don't really think about having MS I mean I walk through this I my body continues to fall apart but but I can tell you that and there was a point about 10 or 11 years into my downfall. You know, they put you on a medicine. They gave me, the, at the time when I got diagnosed, there were only five MS medicines, but by now there may be 20. Um, but when I got diagnosed, like I said, five, a couple of years later, they added a couple more. So they immediately put me on this medicine called Rebif and there really was no change. The doctor kept seeing me deteriorate and everything. And he, after 10 years, he decided, you know, man, we got to try something else because this isn't working. And so he put me on a new different medicine that had come out called Copaxone. Um, now, my doctor, <laughs> sorry, optimal health with multiple sclerosis. My doctor is a scientist who doesn't talk about things unless he knows it's true. He has to have proof. And he bugged me for six months to take vitamin D. So there's something about vitamin D. I, I, I'm researching it. I see it. There's something about taking vitamin D along with the medicine that you're taking. And I fought him for six months. And I said, you're crazy. I grew up thinking, you know, vitamin C doesn't cure your cold. How could a vitamin change anything? So uh, my wife and he got on me enough to where I finally started. And I took intense 5,000 IUs a, a day, sometimes seven, eight. And I did that for six solid months, along with my new medicine regimen. And surprisingly enough, my condition leveled off. I was going down really hard. I mean, really hard. But then my condition leveled off. And about two years, oh, about a year after it leveling off, I was like, and my doctor too was like, well, we got something here. Maybe so I, maybe. I have, I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Mm, let me start with the first one. The first one's about the vitamin D. It yes, taking six months. Why were you being stubborn? What did you have to lose to just do it? I'm a I'm a tough guy, <laughs> and and I just you know like I said I've been I've been on the planet a long time. I've read research and I've never seen a vitamin. You know they tell you vitamin take vitamin C for your cold, but you know you take vitamin C and the cold doesn't change. I just thought of vitamin. What is a vitamin going to do? Because I never really had seen information or research that proved to me that vitamins were effective. But there was nothing to lose to try it. That's I interesting. Oh, that's what my wife said. So I was like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. So the other question is because you're saying you, so for 10 years, there's a, a pretty rapid decline. As that decline was happening, like, what were you feeling and going through? Like, what were your perspective on life, your family, the well, future? You know, we, we moved out here to Colorado and bought an acre of property and built a house on it. And then the property was big enough to where I needed to maintain the property. It was an acre. And I needed to cut the weeds and put the rocks down around the driveway and things. So I convinced my wife to let me buy a tractor. <laughs> And when you buy a tractor from the dealer, they get you the hat and the key ring too. It was very cool. It was a John Deere. So my, my therapy in my head, my therapy was doing things that I couldn't do. To me, having a tractor, even getting on the tractor, I fell every time I got on it. I'd, have to, I'd fall and get it back up again and try a different way to get up. So while this is going on and I'm degrading, I'm thinking, I don't care. I'm going to keep going and doing what I think I can do. And I'll just figure out a different way. And there was a time when we counted it one year, I fell 50 times and ended up in the hospital three. 
Um, you know, for me, just falling off my tractor and doing goofy things, slipping here and there, because I don't, in my mind, have MS. I'm trying to go through it and not think about it. So yeah, I was declining, but I was acting like I didn't have it. And my wife was being very patient with me, falling and ending up in the emergency room and stuff. But um, so I, I just kept thinking that I was going to figure this out. And fortunately, you know, the medicine, there was a definite point to where everything just went, whoa, wait a minute, everything's okay. And, you know, the crazy part about that is that, you know, my, as soon as it leveled off within a year, six months to a year, my doctor is saying, okay, now I want you to get on these brain game things on your computer, man. I need you to start rewiring your brain, get on it, read, do whatever you can, write, um, draw, um, play pinochle, whatever you can do. Um, so I really started hardcore. Um, and I'm sorry to keep jumping around like this. But now I, we're talking about a year after the doctor says, start using your brain. A friend of mine, because I was in the broadcasting business and in the music business for quite a while. There was a guy named Vince Pellegrino. He had the, the number one independent magazine uh, for me, uh, music, current music magazine in America at the time. Um, I had been out of the business for 10 years. And he called one day in November and said, you know what? Well, we had he called on our, we, I, I'm an April, a 420 birthday, easy to remember. And he's an April Fool's birthday, April 1st. So every year we call and say happy birthday. But one year he called and he said, you know what, Manny, I want you to come to my, he has a big party every year to give awards to the promoters who make Taylor Swift's a famous. You see Taylor Swift at the Grammys, but her records have to get played by radio stations. And there's promoters out there that do this. And he had a big convention and a big party for them every year. And he said, I want you to come out because I think it's time that we give you an, a, a lifetime achievement award because I just disappeared. When I left the business, I disappeared. So he brought me out to New York and I saw friends I hadn't seen for 33 years. My life was rejuvenated. So my condition leveled off. I start doing brain games. I see my friends. I'm really happy. I'm, I, I'm, I feel good again. And then a month later, my friend dies. <laughs> so now I feel like he's taken me to New York to try to wake me up so that I don't sit in this neutral position. He even told me while I was there, I want you to get back to work. You got to get back in the business. After 10 years, you can't get back in the radio music industry. It's all changed. But what it did for me was it, it caused me to learn how to write. You know, I, I wanted to tell my story about my, my career, about getting diagnosed and the amazing job my wife had done to get me through all this. And I wanted to put it in my memoir, which is Come Get Me, Mother, I'm Through, which is the name of my book. So I wanted to write that book. But when you're on the radio, it's different than writing on a piece of paper. So I had to have someone teach me how to write. So my friend dies. I feel like I need to do something. I think I want to write my memoir. I go and I hire a woman to teach me how to do this. She is re relentless with me. She makes me read books on how to do this. And then she, uh, I would write and she'd send it back all corrected. And this went on for a year before I actually started penning my uh, memoir. But all of that has made me better because you know, MS affects your voice. So there's something called dystonia, I think is the word. And there was a point that you could hardly even hear me. It was gone. But I think my brain has been rewired because I used to have a lot of trouble concentrating. I write now all the time and I, I, I write, you know, three and four hours a day. So I think that, yeah, I'm sick. I've still got MS. I still take medicine every day. And I know people who have stopped taking medicine and gotten worse than they were in the beginning. So I'm going to stay on my medicine, knowing that I could relapse at any moment. But I, once again, in my mind, I don't think I have this. I'm going through this. I'm going past this. I have a very positive wife who is, uh, she's the reason why I wrote the book. I wanted to get everybody to understand how important a good caregiver is and how important my wife was to my success. So of getting through this so far. So. Oh, that is so incredibly beautiful. And, <laughs> and, and I, but I, 
I don't plan these things for, That's okay, for those, who are, okay. who are, those who are listening, but it is it's, literally, it's one of the reasons why I do the 365 First Challenge, because it is about doing neuroplasticity. It is about believing that we have power and control over our brains, not just our minds. We can set our mindset, yes, but our brains and the, you know, MS, sounds like a horrible disease but it's leaving you your mind your brain right it's it, it, it's impacting it and that's changing your body but you still have control of your mind and just the fact that you said hey i technically you're shifting your voice you're, you've shifted your white uh, even though you still have a amazing <laughs> radio voice exactly. shifting your voice from speaking to writing greater concentration and you're know, still gaining victories in the process because of you're mm -hmm. not accepting you're, you're you're not accepting that this that this is it like this is you can still do so much and i absolutely love that and it is there's so much you can still learn always oh. constantly oh, yeah. you'll you'll you never get to the end of what you can learn and what you can do uh, as long as your your mind is still active and you know the the, the body up to you know up to a certain point and yes ma'am um, i fully believe in mind control i believe you have the you have the ability to fix a lot of things in your head your attitude in the day when you wake up you set your attitude when you wake up. You can either be a good person or you can be a bad person. And that's the way you wake up. So I, I'm, I'm a real positive person and I've got an amazing wife. My wife is an international business coach. Um, by that, I mean, she works for the Keller Williams Real Estate Company, but she's a coach within that company. It's a MAPS coach. And what she does is she takes businesses every 30 minutes. She's on the phone from seven o'clock in the morning till five in the afternoon. Every 30 minutes, she connects with a different real estate company organization around the world. And she gets their profit law. She sees all their finances. She helps them. She coaches them. And when this pandemic thing broke about three months ago, and everybody was in absolute loss of what was going on, what was going on behind the scenes were people like my wife who were getting together with the business community saying, you've got to stay strong. You've got to be ready because we're going to come out of this soon. And when we come out of this, you're going to have to be prepared to be running and ready to go. So behind the scenes during this whole pandemic thing, there's been this underlying rush of the business community, the real estate agents around my wife's company. They're all set to get back to work because we need to get this country back to work as quickly as we possibly can. But you have to wear a mask to do so. <laughs> but my wife does that all day. And so I've got a lady in my life that, that coaches people, makes them better, encourages them, and she's extremely successful at it. And she's my partner. So yeah, I'm, she's I'm applying a, that to the husband, <laughs> to the hubby, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So to keep, to keep that, that right mindset and, you know, the things, the themes that keep coming up out of the stories to keep yeah. taking that next step forward That's and, right. you know, to to believe in yourself and to believe in, you know, the possibilities in it, the, the magic, the magic that happens when you engage with life, when you engage with what's happening and that you're not giving up on it. I think that's, you know, that's the biggest key. And I, we talked a little bit before the show started. It's like, I, I've never interviewed somebody who, has a chronic disease before and I didn't know what to expect like I didn't know I didn't want to say anything insensitive I didn't want to say anything <laughs> stupid and I didn't yes. know like you know I didn't know you so I don't know like what place is he coming from and and I love that you're coming from that that place of empowerment and positivity and um, still beauty and wonder for what life has to offer and what you can still provide the world, right? You're still, it's very clear talking to you before, the sh you know, before the show, you see, like, I can still have an impact in the world. I can still share my wisdom. I can still mentor. I can still be there and to make a difference. And so I, I want to... Uh, Say I'm thank gonna, you to you for that. Okay. Well, I'm going to promote this again then because of what you just said. I really believe uh, in, the, in, in 
what needs to happen in this country. Uh, it just so happens that, you know, about two or three weeks before George Floyd uh, was murdered, I started reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and I was told to, in seventh grade, read that book. And I'm sure I faked the book report and probably failed it. But I finally got to read To Kill a Mockingbird. And, to, and what the realization to me over and over again was it was set in 1935, and these things are still going on. So I'm trying to get young people to wake up and to start and I know it's coming from a 65 year old boy, man, but <laughs> I'm trying to get young people to wake up and take control of our, our country. Uh, I think it's real important now that we have, we have a time where things really can change. And um, I've never seen it like this. I've been on the planet for 65 years. I've never seen it like this. And I'm hoping that this is a change that needs to happen. But it, and then after I read To Kill a Mockingbird, I read her next, well, actually remember, go set a watchman was the precursor to To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. So when you read to, uh, Go Set a Watchman, you see once again, even though it's set 30 years after 1935, it's set in 1965, the same things. So we need to change it. We need to I, I, I watched a movie and it, it, um, I think it's called the same thing. I was trying to find it because Amazon has a, uh, they've made a lot of their movies related to um, Black race, Lives Matter. Black, yeah, Black Lives Matter. And, and um, so, you know, I've been watching some of, some of those movies and yeah. one of them was that movie and it takes place in a town where the book was written. It's like, nobody has learned anything, but yet again, and that actually, that was in the early 2000s, I think. So now again, fast forward another 20 years and we're still well, like how, well, you know, well, we do know. It's not like, how does this happen? It happens because people aren't changing. People well, are not accepting uh, the, the truth. But understand that after Lincoln freed the slaves, there was a small minority of white people who decided they were going to terrorize black people. A small minority of those people who had children, they fed them that bile. Those kids had children, they fed them that bile. You're still looking at a minority, but they are extremely powerful in their beliefs. So but yeah. what correct, agree, and we're we're going off track and oh, I'm, I'm gonna get us I'm, I'll, I'll get us back on track. But okay. what one of the things that has always empowered that minority is all of those who have been in denial about the truth. So it's it's and this is where I think things are finally changing and we're seeing in the protests where a lot more white people are showing up and they understand that because they have not provided the support because they have not said this is true it really is happening to you uh, it has been allowed to continue so when you're a bystander to things happening even though you, you well I'm not doing it well, being a by bystander makes you just as guilty, quite guilty. frankly. Yes. Yes. So, you know, no silence. more, no more bystanding, no more silence. And it is because now finally it's caught on video and things that cannot be denied. It's not one person's word against another person's word. And then it's, it happens it's video. It happened, it happened again yesterday. <laughs> then it just yeah. happens again yesterday. So, and, and that makes you, you know, it's like, how can it still be? It's happening. I but mean, it, racism it, is systematic in America. It's been that way for 400 years. And specifically, it has never changed. We've got to stop it. It's got to stop. Yeah. So, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. No, it's, it's a great, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a topic that anytime that can be brought up and addressed, it, it, it should be, it should absolutely be uh, addressed. So, all right, well, let's switch over and let's play the first time in lightning round okay. and let's uh, explore maybe some some new things to add to your to your list or mm -hmm. just learn a little bit more about you. So the way the first time lightning round works is I'm going to give you 10 different first time options. Mm -hmm. If it's something you've done before, you would you'd say up. Or I've done it before. If you're on the app, you would swipe up. If it's something you've never done or not interested, then you, it's swipe left. So I'm not interested. And if something you've never done would like to do, then we go right. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, do a 23andMe test. So one of those. Um, I would do that, right? Yeah, yeah, 
right. You would do that. Okay. That's my right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Next one is perform in an open mic night. No problem. You've done no that problem. before. You've done that before. <laughs> no, or? I've never. I've never done that before. But because Should... now, when you say open mic, that uh, I get the impression you're talking open mic comedian type of open mic. So it could be. So open night is could be music, oh, could, well, then, anything. Could be reading poetry. I, could be doing comedy. I just remembered that uh, I used to host uh, a, a cruise line comedy show, and I was pretty funny back then. So I've already done that. Thank you. You've already done that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, take, obviously with a pet, but take a pet obedience training class. I'm pretty good with animals. I don't think I need to do that. Don't need to no, do that. Mm. Okay, we're going left. Uh, buy a photograph. Just buy a photograph? Like, no. yeah, find a photograph, a gallery or online and just buy, buy it. Yes, ma'am. I am an art fan. I would find something. Okay, we'll do that. Do that. Yes, okay. Play Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> the game. No, ma'am. <laughs> Not interested in games. All right. Uh, get teeth whitening. Well, when you have multiple sclerosis, uh, your nerves become hyperactive. So when I first was diagnosed, and of course, you need to get your teeth clean every six months, what would happen was that the, the doctor would touch a nerve and my entire body would react. And so they couldn't give me enough Novocaine. It would still happen. So there came a decision where the doctors said, you know what, man, we need to take all those teeth out. You're going to be miserable the rest of your life. So I have all fake teeth. <laughs> Drilled into my head. See, And you know, it's funny because when you get these made up teeth, they make them perfect. Okay. Well, I had, I was at a doctor who told me, because I've always had a gap in my front teeth. So I, I told him, I said, I've been on TV. People know me. You know, they're going to see him. And, and if his teeth are perfect, they're going to go, wait a minute, his teeth are perfect. How'd that happen? So I had to leave that dentist and go to a specialist who made these teeth to put a gap in because the, the other dude wouldn't do it. So I had to go to a special dentist who drilled these teeth in my head and put a gap in it for me so I would at least look <sighs> like it's me. So, okay, now I probably told you way too much there. So. No, that's fascinating. So that's interesting. Cause I mean, I have like crooked bottom teeth and if they pulled them out, I'd be like, yeah, are you gonna put some straight ones in? So it's interesting that you decided it, oh. you, you wanted to stay the same. You weren't yes, for perfection, yeah. you, want, you were for who you are. And I didn't want to go to the dentist anymore. It's like, whoa, I can't take this. This is ridiculous. Every six months, yeah. I'm gonna have to go through this. And I'm telling you, my wife is the one who said, we're not doing this. This is torture for you. So we're doing this. We're changing it. That's the end of it. So once again, wifey, thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, donate a gift certificate. Oh, we, I would, I donate all the time. I'm a giver. Okay. Go skeet shooting. I'd love to, would love to do that. Make soup from scratch. I can do that. I'm a pretty good chef for an old All one. right. What's a, uh... Do you remember the first from scratch soup you made? What it what kind it was? Oh, wow. You know what? I'm my wife is Cuban. Uh, her parents immigrated from Havana to Miami. My wife is first generation Cuban. Um, I lived in Miami from 1976 to around 2005 for 25 years. I eat Cuban food. I will guarantee you the first soup I tried to make was sopa de pollo. Uh, chicken soup, only Cuban style, because it comes with lime juice in it. Oh, so. oh excellent. Okay, uh, play backgammon. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I tried. I have no brain space for things like that. I'm not a game player. Not a game player. Oh, it's the it's the gambling game backgammon. Oh, I, I don't even. I didn't even know. I wouldn't. Even... <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, that completes the first time lightning round. You. And usually I would ask the first time story prompt, but there's no prompt for today because I'm kind of transitioning. So, hmm. hmm. Instead, I will ask, so what is, do you have a first time in your experience that is on your list? Uh, something that I want to do for the first time? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. And I'm going to put this out there right now. 
remember the last thing I did was play golf on a golf course. I had just moved that golf course. Uh, Don Shula is a legend in football land and he has this development with a golf course on it. I was so proud to be able to live on that golf course. I played golf for two, two years, finally got good enough to where I could play in front of people and then the MS kicked in. I would love to get back on the golf course, but remember, because I can't, my legs don't work, there is a special designed golf cart that comes out of Germany. <laughs> now in America, we, in America, we try because they try to get handicapped people on the golf course. And I appreciate that. But what we've done in America is we've designed a chair that kind of sits up and all you do is sit up and you swing from a sitting position. There's a golf cart that's made in Germany that actually wraps around you like an egg and then it sits you up to where you stand up. It supports you and everything and you can swing from a stand up position. That's what I wanna do someday. That'll be my first time. My wife is trying, I've been trying desperately to find, they don't make them in America. Now, what, what they do is they take these golf carts, they've imported some and they take them to hospitals around America and let vets play them, disabled vets. They get to use these golf carts. So I've seen them. I'm not a vet. <laughs> I feel funny going, hey, could I borrow you? Because I want to go play golf. To, I mean, the vets, let them go. But I would love to be able to find one of these golf carts one day so I could go out and play golf again for my first time back on the golf course. All yeah. right. Well, I hope that will happen for you. Yeah, you got you to love German engineering. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So final question is, how have you been making the best out of the current situation with the pandemic? Um, anxiety is ruthless on me. When all this first came down, my wife put me in the hibernation quarantine on March 10th. The president made his announcement on March 13th. Uh, at that point, I had a, an anxiety attack and mine incur total body cramping, heart palpitating. I can't breathe because the pressure of what was going on got to me so badly. I had to distract myself. So my mode to distract myself was to give myself a little TV show. For like two and a half months, I went on FaceTime Live every day and I, I did a thing called One Cocktail with Kid. And I've got followers because I was on the radio in America and different places. So I just went on live and said, okay, we're going to sit here for the next few minutes. We're going to have one cocktail together. And I just did it with people that I could see their names scroll up and I'd say hi to them and things. Well, that turned into me actually having guests. Um, and I would Zoom a conversation and put it on my live Facebook page. But I had, I had fairly important guests. Uh, there's one of my friends is the most has the largest Christian radio listening audience in America, works out of Dallas. I had Frank Reed on. Another one of my friends, uh, Eric Rhodes from Streamline Art Video, he's trying to teach a million people how to paint and has designed a special eight note process that is uh, uh, paintbynote.com to actually teach you how to paint. And then I had my friend, Maddie Montfort, who used to be on, um, there was an ABC TV talk show called Mike and Maddie. Well, she's the Maddie of Maddie of Maddie uh, of, of Mike and Maddie. And she and I worked together years ago. So I would bring my friends on as guests and thousands, I had two or 3000 people enjoying this. But what this did was every day I had to get up and I had to put my show together. And I didn't think about what was going on because man, I'm telling you, this ain't the second wave. This is still the first wave. The second one's coming. Um, this is still scary. Uh, I know y'all want to get out and go to Fuddruckers and eat your hamburgers, but you probably should wear a mask because this is a real process. This is not a joke. So it really got to me. But two and a half months later, I even told people in the beginning, I didn't know how long I was going to do it, but it, it lasted for about two and a half months, had three or 4,000 people listening and watching, and it was just fun. And it distracted me. But yeah. because I'm a writer, I wanted to stop doing it because I wanted to get back to writing. I've got, I'm in the middle of a new book I've, I've come up with and I research these books. I mean, I'm talking to my physical therapist about how my protagonist is having to go through physical therapy. And I've got a lady here who ran for uh, states for uh, uh, a U.S. Senator. Uh, her name is Trish Zornio. I, I'm talking to her about what it's like 
uh, to run for office because my protagonist is going to run for office. So yeah. this is all good research for me. These are things I like doing. So I wanted to stop that, although it was fun. I wanted to stop it because I wanted to get back to writing. And, and now I'm back to writing again and doing podcast interviews with nice people. Oh. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming on. And yeah, it, it is a beautiful thing about being an author is that you do discover you got to go find out who these people are, who your characters are going to be. And um, you don't become an expert in those fields, but you do need to, get, you know, get some knowledge. So there's, there's truth to your characters. So it is a, it is a fun process of oh, kind awesome. of being a detective and explorer of, of people and who they are and what makes them tick and all of that. So and that's you can really kind of great. Get, you can get an idea of the things I write at krcurry.com. That's my webpage has the books up there that I've written. Plus, it's got my blogs up there. I put a blog up every week and it's got my 2020 commencement speech and it's got the information I put up about what I found out about To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, it's pretty special information. So krcurry.com if anybody wants to jump on and read some stuff. All okay. right, Kim. Well, thank you for coming on. This was really fun, Ann. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.